Today we will review The Social Network, an Oscar award winning film about Mark Zuckerberg and the creation of Facebook. It's a powerful film which tells us what a secular hero looks like. Mark is not driven by greed, yet because of his tremendous innovation and creativity, he became the second youngest self-made billionaire in history. We will look at what a secular hero looks like. Last week, the college group at Trinity Church in Clovis, California, looked at one of my lectures given at the University of Minnesota from Paul to Paris Hilton, how it defeated Messiah, conquered Rome, and redefined heroism. We have the portrait of a secular hero who would sacrifice every one of his friends for the sake of his own success. Can that really create a social network? Or is a genuine community created when people make the heroic choice of denying themselves for the sake of their friends? Tonight we are reviewing The Social Network the finest movie of the year 2010, according to uh, both the Oscars and various uh, reviewers. It made about almost $97 million at the box office alone. So it was a very important film. And uh, I'm looking at the film as a story of Mark Zuckerberg, the creator of Facebook, as a representing a secular hero, what heroism would mean after secularization of America. This is continuation of last week when we looked at the video uh, from Paul to Paris Hilton. Is that a signifying sun setting on the West, decline of the West, a decline particularly of the definition of heroism, uh, what makes a person a hero? And um, so we are really continuing that. We looked a little bit uh, into the cross as definition of uh, heroism last week. And today we will look at a hero who doesn't believe in cross, who very consciously, intentionally rejects the cross. Now, this is not really a discussion of Mark Zuckerberg, the person, because I don't know him and most of us don't know him. Uh, this is a review of the film, which is based on his life. And we understand that film is taking artistic liberties, exaggerating some things, condensing some things. The film is not absolutely accurate. And, um, but, so, uh, just two comments. David Fincher, who directed the film, he uh, was given the Best Director Award. Two, two reviews to uh, help you see how important the critics judged the film to be. One is a um, uh, comment from, in Rolling Stones by Peter Travers. He says, the Social Network is the movie of the year, but Fincher and Sorkin triumph by taking it further, lacing their scathing wit with an aching sadness. They define the dark irony of the past decade. So here is Rolling Stone, very impressed by the film, but seeing that there is an aching sadness in this portrayal of a secular hero, and it is defining the dark irony of the past decade. So a secular critic is seeing the film as the dark irony of the sec uh, past decade. It's that's uh, since the impact of films such as Wall Street have changed America and changed American economy. Now here is Rotten Tomatoes, not. Uh, usually complimentary to films, but 
It says it's an impeccably scripted, beautifully directed, and filled with fine performances. The Social Network is a riveting, ambitious example of modern filmmaking at its finest. So we are looking at an important film which uh, really is a mirror of uh, the best of American secular American culture. But we are going behind uh, and below the superficial performances, etc. So we are not rejecting the uh, artistic abilities and performances. Those things we are acknowledging were there, they were good, they deserved recognition. But we are go going at the message itself, the social network. Is Mark Zuckerberg really creating social network? Or is it an example of growing social darkness? That's the question that we are uh, going to be uh, looking at. And I'm not preaching. You are helping answer the questions. So let's look at the first uh, question. What makes Mark Zuckerberg a hero? He is a hero. And what makes him a hero? So what, in your opinion, makes him a genuine hero? His ideas and his, the amount of wealth that he ends up kind of gathering for himself, so his success. His financial success is obviously one important factor. Just during the last five days, he has made $4 billion, $4.7 billion uh, during the last four days. So his once they began advertising on mobile devices, phones, etc., uh, fa Facebook's value went way high. So personally, he is now the 41st, 41, 41st richest person in the world, second youngest self-made billionaire in history. So uh, his success, and interestingly. He is not driven by greed. So even though he's not driven by greed, making money was not his passion. Uh, he did succeed in making enormous amount of money. So that's one factor that makes him a hero. So let's move to the next question. That uh, how does Mark actually treat his social network? That is his friends, supporters, community and college. I remember at the beginning, beginning of the movie, he was really condescending to his girlfriend, and um, also his uh, his friend, his roommate. It seemed like uh, he was uh, not really that important. What was important was uh, his project, and at the beginning of the movie, he makes that project that compares uh, two girl, like each girl from a different frat. And so, like, he didn't really care about like their feelings when he made that program in the beginning. Um, Face mesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like he didn't. It seemed like he was. Like, he didn't really care about anyone. Like, I, I don't remember during the whole movie, like him, like caring about anyone. Mm -hmm. So he didn't care for the social network. What else? Um, he didn't really care uh, for his college at all, you know. Where you ha whereas you had the twin brothers who kind of, um, when they were trying to um, try to get the college to recognize that they had that he had stolen intellectual property from them, they went through all the loops, you know. And they they said, you know, we're gentlemen of Harvard. He, on the other hand, after he makes uh, face smash and crashes the server, um, is goes to this board meeting and says, well, actually, I've done you a favor because I've exposed the loopholes and you know, the holes in your system, and I've exposed the weaknesses in your system. Um, so even when he's in trouble for something that uh, to everybody else is obviously right and wrong, or is is wrong, pardon me, um, he. Uh, he decides that no, you know, I, whatever I do is, you know, progressive. Whatever I do is good. Yep. So, so I've I've broken into your security, and I deserve recognition that I've shown holes in your security system. It's like I walk into girls' dorms, rape some girls. That's too bad that you don't have a good enough security for those girls. <laughs> I, you should recognize me, honor me for showing how poor your security is. That's his attitude. Uh, so he, uh, but the other point you made that the twin brothers, uh, Cameron and Tyler, they really respect Harvard University. He has no respect for his college. 
he shows total contempt and utter disrespect for his friends, for his college. Um, well, how does he treat his supporters? Uh, it seems to me uh, he treated them just to, he used them, uh, didn't, didn't show appreciation, um, but he was quick to use them for whatever whatever he could get out of them. So he he used them. Did he abuse them? What's the chicken story? Anyone remember? You know, one of the uh, processes um, that his friend has to uh, undergo in order to be initiated into this frat is he has to carry on a chicken with him, either for all, the whole day or some length of time. The week. Um, the week, yeah. So he's in the dining commons, and he has his chicken, and he has to feed the chicken, and all they have at this dining commons is chicken. So he feeds the chicken chicken. And um, so there's a story that gets around in the Harvard newspaper um, that is like bashing him for like animal cannibalism or something to that extent. So thank you. So at that time when the story appeared, Eduardo thought that the twin brothers were the ones who had planted the story because they were trying to destroy it. But gradually, as he really, the light dawns upon him as uh, on the character of Mark Zuckerberg, he comes to believe that it was actually Mark who planted the story at the time when Eduardo is his only supporter. He's putting the money in, he's the financial head of the company. And uh, um, Mark is thinking ahead to de de destroy his friend that you because of your cruelty to animals which is published in a local newspaper you are a shame for the company so eduardo is building him up and how is he repaying his best friend and supporter destroying him What's that last conversation with the lawyer? She's uh, basically telling him, you're not likable. The jury's going to uh, uh, not like you and side with the, others, the other side in court. So you better settle and pay these people off, pay by their silence. The jury will have a good reason to think that you are the one who called the cops to get your best friends arrested because you want to get them out of the company to have sole control of the company. So Sean Parker is celebrating this party, one millionth uh, user of Facebook. Why aren't you there in the party? The police comes, if you remember the film, the police comes, and there's drugs, and there's underage uh, girls uh, there in the party uh, and with sexual suggestion that um, this is a terrible party, so some of them get arrested. So he has not only used the ideas from his rivals, but he has used and abused every single one of his supporter. So a secular hero is one who would sacrifice his best friends for his own success. What matters is success. Right? So let's go to the next question. Is it inappropriate for an atheist, he calls himself an atheist, uh, is it inappropriate for an atheist to sacrifice every one of his friends for his own success? Is it in inappropriate for an atheist? It seems to me it's very consistent. Uh, 
and appropriate for an atheist to do that, why why wouldn't they? If uh, if there is no God, if there is no authority over a person, I don't have to answer to anyone. Uh, you know, I I define what's right, and and uh, whoever I need to step on, so be it. Yep. Yeah, it's like um, as uh, Nishi said, and thus says Zarathustra. He said, um, "God is dead, man is God. So if man is God, then man defines morality, and therefore um, everything is permitted." Yep. Yeah, I'm thinking of another. Uh Popular philosopher right now is Ayn Rand. Um, her objectivism uh, would fit perfectly with this if you had read any of her things. Yeah. So it is not only not inappropriate, it's perfectly appropriate because life is a struggle for existence and it is survival of the... And he sees himself as the fittest, as most able, most capable, and so I use you and I abuse you and I destroy you. I'm not here to sacrifice myself for you, but to sacrifice you for myself. Now, this is exactly what Stalin did. Uh, Lenin was the leader of the communist revolution in Russia. And after his death, there were several big leaders in the communist party and uh, there were four of them, good economists, good thinkers from Marxist point of view, who were arguing that agriculture should be collectivized. And uh, Stalin said that these guys are saying plunder the peasants, so let's arrest them, kill them. They're trying to be the national leaders, but they are asking us to for plundering the uh, peasantry. So he has them arrested and killed. And then in 1931-32, he does exactly what they had been advocating, collectivize agriculture, take everyone's farms and implements and horses and oxen and plows, uh, which is what took uh, Russian agriculture and economy into a hole from which Russia never recovered uh, because uh, people were forced to work on their own land. Earlier they owned it. It was private property but private property was collectivized. So uh, what, uh, what Zuckerberg is doing in his own little uh, sphere, at this moment it is a little sphere, but imagine this happening with a Republican Party or Democratic Party of someone who is following exactly the same philosophy of a secular hero, capturing power and then destroying all his supporters so that he might have the sole control because he's the brightest and the best and the leader, man of steel, Stalin. Right? So it's uh, at least you. I, I hope that once we are on YouTube, we will have an atheist responding uh, to this and you will be discussing and debating with them. But here you are agreeing with me that what Zuckerberg does as a secular hero is perfectly appropriate in a secular atheistic mindset. So why should one love uh, his neighbor or her neighbor as oneself? It's not something which secularism can teach or is teaching. The finest universities in America are not teaching that anymore. Why not? Why can't they teach? I can think of one repercussion of not loving one's neighbor or one's enemy as himself, and that's, um, you know, I think most aptly summarized in the quote, an eye for an eye and the whole world will go blind. You know, the fact that when we take revenge on another person for not loving us, when we don't love our neighbor, we don't love our enemy, um, then that just uh, spreads chaos. And chaos in the end um, is not productive for a society um, and it's not productive uh, for people in any, in any way, shape, or form. So loving your neighbor as yourself, uh, not coveting your neighbor's property, but he is stealing his neighbor's property, their intellectual property, right? We On the converse of that is if, um, if we're uh, going with Darwinism, we're pawn scum, then he could do, he can stomp on people because they're not made in God's image. 
they're just amoebas, so what does it matter? Exactly. Thank you. So it is when you don't know God, when you reject God, you have to reject his image. It's no longer precious or valuable. A human being then only has whatever value you give it to him or her. He is not valuable in himself, which is the heart of American society that we hold these truths to be sacred, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That's dignity of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And the governments are instituted to defend these rights. Why does government exist? Now imagine when the worldview which is controlling and guiding Marx's uh, behavior becomes the guiding philosophy of the White House, the Capitol Hill, the Wall Street, and uh, the Pentagon. What happens? What is the social cost of Zuckerberg's secular success? He, he has made billions, but what has his success cost America? We, we've just talked about one thing, the loss of privacy, potential loss of, loss of privacy, but what else? Oh, I was just saying the privacy, what you just as I thought of, but um, I think propriety and decency. I think that what you were saying about people just post so much information about things that really should not be spoken about. So there's just this reckless, you know, sense of, of say whatever, do whatever. It's okay because it's just me. And there's no no social consciousness among the social networkers. They just each man to his own creativity and expression of his being. Thank you. Are you saying something? Oh yeah. I, I was going to say um, I think we've lost also an authenticity of relation to each other. Um, you know, which is kind of the cost of Zuckerberg's social network. In the end, the irony is that he builds a social network but doesn't have one to begin with, um, and sacrifices his own friends. And so, in that regard, um, going along with decency, you know, I think we we lose this um, this uh, we lose authentic means. I think of communicating with each other as well. Eduardo is in uh, New York. He's the only investor. He's invested nineteen thousand dollars to get the company going. Uh, now. Uh, an in, in, in investor has come on board from the Silicon Valley with half a million dollars. So he is invited to restructure the company. And Mark's lawyer, which Eduardo thinks are his lawyers, are telling him that your shares are being raised from 30% to 34%. And Mark's share is coming down from 67, 70% down to 51%. So he is an MBA from Harvard. Now, what does he do? He signs it without having his lawyers read it and check it. He trusts his friend, he trusts his lawyers. And he signs. He's a gentleman from Harvard. But what's happening? He's being deceived. He's being deceived where his shares are coming down from 30% to 0.3%. So, what does he have to do? How, how does he feel what he should have done? 
he feels he shouldn't have trusted just gone out on a limb and trusted his friend he should have had his lawyers read it first he should have had his law his lawyers but he's already put his money 19 percent he's an unemployed harvard graduate mark has five hundred thousand dollars now half a million dollars so mark can buy the best lawyers who are experts in lying and deceiving so if he wants to stay in business what would a lawyer cost him now that the company is already half a million uh, plus what would a lawyer charge him any guess Five hundred an hour, easily twenty thousand dollars or something. Um, so, what has, what is the cost of Zuckerberg's secular success? Yeah, I think trust. America is no longer a place where you can trust. your business partners, your friends. Honesty. Honesty is gone. Lawyer is not there as a servant of the law. He's a servant of money. He's not serving law. He's not there to make sure that what is right is being done. But he's serving money, and for the sake of money, he will deceive. So the cost of secular success is the very soul of America. Why are the Chinese investing in America? Why are the sheikhs from Middle East investing in America? What's the rate of the, uh, at what rate is American economy growing? 2%. At what rate is Chinese economy growing? Pardon me? 10% average. So why aren't Chinese investing in China? Why are they investing in America? Why are they buying your debt? They uh, they still perceive some sense of of honesty and trustworthiness um, here in America, whereas in other places around the world they've uh, long let go of that. Why does she ditch him? She doesn't trust him. Does she love him? Uh, I would think that trust is a part of love. So if she suspects that he's has other agendas going on and he's not speaking truth, and acting with integrity towards her, then how can she love him? She doesn't trust him. So she has sent 47 text messages. He hasn't responded to one. Does that give her a right to question what's going on? She looks at the Facebook and his relationship status says that he's single. He's not affirming that he is in a relationship with her. Does he like her? Um, I'd say that he does like her. You know, he bought her the scarf. You know, he, he thought of her. And we didn't uh, see the rest of it. She burnt it. <laughs> So, he likes her enough to bribe her 
but not to respond to her on social media. Here is the CFO of uh, Facebook who is misleading, according to her, he is using Facebook to mislead other girls. That's how she interprets right or wrong, right? That Facebook is being used to mislead. When you don't have respect, you don't have commitment, you don't have love, can you build social network? So, so what's happening to the culture that believes that Facebook is social network? The, the second commandment that you had stated there, love you know, your neighbor as yourself, right? I believe that, that the social network people actually believe that they are practicing that, but they have redefined it completely. Right. So to love your neighbor is to give your neighbor the freedom to be who they want to be, to tolerate them and not to judge them. If they want to be, you know, greedy and pursue things with great ambition and override other people, that's their business. But you don't have to do that. Right. As opposed to like, I, I just feel like the second commandment, everybody kind of endorses it out in society. If you'd say, you know, do you respect, love your neighbor as yourself? You know, this from the statement from Jesus, and they'd all said, oh, yes, we agree with that. But I think it's been redefined. What do you think? Um, most people's attitude would be, yes, those are nice words, but ultimately people's choices are governed by what they really believe in deep down in their hearts. So to believe that I must love my neighbor as myself, I have to believe that my neighbor is precious, is valuable, is made in God's image, is an object of God's love. And I'm under an obligation. So even when I feel like hating my neighbor, I am actually required to love and serve. So I have to go against my interest. You know, it's easy for me to love your neighbor. But it's my neighbor that I can't stand. It's easy to love your wife. It's my wife who's the problem because she's the one who asked me to get up and make tea in the morning or breakfast which when I want to be sleeping or whatever. So um, um, it's... But that's why I need the command, husbands, love your wife, not your neighbor's wife. Um, love your neighbor, not your relative's neighbor. It's my neighbor I have to live with who might be messy, whose y your yard might be messy, whose dog might be very noisy, who, whatever. So uh, to say that this is a good command, I'm sure everybody will agree. But the great, uh, what we have seen is that this command is needed. This command is needed, is commanded repeatedly. This is the heart, Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments, love God, love your neighbor. But this is what America has removed. And what we've just seen in this movie is the practical consequences of removing the commandment. So to say that everybody loves, uh, everybody would agree that we love our neighbor as ourselves. No, if, if everybody was actually loving their neighbor as themselves, uh, we wouldn't need that commandment. Um, the commandment is needed is because we don't love our neighbors. And uh, it is a difficult thing. It's a costly thing. It costs ultimately our blood. Michelle, just one question, uh, maybe to end with. <clears throat> um, when you speak of using social media uh, for the furthering of the gospel, uh, it it seems a little bit like just the ultimate mega church project, uh, the biggest big tent meeting you can imagine. Uh, how does that square with Jesus's example of 
of investing in 12 disciples and almost appearing to be chasing away the crowds and investing and investing and investing in these 12. Well, th thank you very much. Actually, I'm finding that every day I end up with that. So when I post something on Facebook, I might have 50 comments in a 24-hour period, but in the end I'm really talking to one person who is persisting uh, with questions. So I have to really count the cost and choose that, okay, he's there in Ethiopia, he's there in South Africa, he's there in Colombia or Peru, and he is really interested in this. Others have dropped out of the conversation. They Maybe they are reading once in a while, but it is this person that I'm uh, teaching biblical worldview to or answering the problems that he's facing. So <clears throat> that's happening every day that I end up uh, spending my time, which is a precious commodity, intellectual energy and effort in talking to one person. So normally, like to, yeah, this email, uh, the Facebook entry, which I put two days ago, uh, yesterday was it, yesterday, about t tonight. Altogether, we may have had about 40 people who said they like the comment and maybe 20, 25 conversations. Uh, but it was one Indian, I'm not sure where he lives, uh, who persisted uh, in. But, uh, but it is having an impact. But what it needs is a number of us, <clears throat> particularly when you get involved, your non-Christian friends get involved because some of the conversation is happening on your Facebook. So something often that has happened between me and Brian, Brian would post something and then his friends who are going on his Facebook, I'm talking to his friends on his Facebook. Um, <clears throat> so that begins to multiply.